I wanted to uh, kind of talk about your process. I was watching a video of you breaking down your track, uh, The Relic with Rochelle Jordan, um, beautiful mm -hmm. track. So kind of moving back to your uh, release before that. And you said you had three phases that you you work on, which is creation, arrangement phase, sort of the generation phase. Then you move into the stemming phase and then you mm -hmm. mix the audio. And I thought that was really interesting um, because I personally just mix right in my track. Um, but the way that you put it is that it takes away the distraction from like all the other plugins and things that you have going on. So you can just focus on the mix down process. Um, but yeah, I was just curious if you could walk us through a little bit your, your three phases of uh, your workflow. Yeah. Um... So yeah, I think you, you pretty much summed it up there. You know, the, the first phase is that creative phase where I just, you know, like to let things flow. And, you know, sometimes I'll come in with a kind of a, a objective and an intention of like what I want to do, like whether it's experimenting with a specific genre or if there's, you know, some samples that I've made like on a synth or cu cutting up some like granular synthesis jams that I did and making that into a song, like whatever, you know, sometimes I'll come in to the studio and have that intention of like, okay, this is what I'm going to do today. But otherwise I, um, a lot of times I just like to sit down in front of the piano um, or, well, it's my 88 key MIDI controller, uh, fully weighted. Uh, and, nice. <laughs> but, but I typically have like, in my demo writing template in Ableton is like, there's a piano plugin, um, I believe it's the Gentleman. Uh, it's like an upright uh, native instruments uh, library, a piano library. Uh, okay. And uh, I just start to play and like see where things go. And uh, the cool thing about Ableton, the newer versions, I think maybe the past, I think they started either in nine or 10 mm -hmm. uh, where, if you just start playing, Ableton's kind of recording it in the background, even if you hadn't press record. And then if you're like, ooh, that sounded really cool, you just hit a button and then all the MIDI pops up for uh, whatever you just were playing. Right, and right. There's, there's, so something, cool. there's something nice about that because like when I hit record, it's like I'm almost like being conscious of what I'm playing. Whereas if I just open up a session and just start playing, I... I forget that it, that's even a feature, but it's maybe part of my subconscious knows. So it's like, yeah. you know, allowing me to be a little less like meandering and, and maybe a, a little more conscious of what I'm playing, but in a good way. That's um, great, yeah. Uh, and then, yeah, I'll like, if I land on something, whether that's a interesting chord progression or, you know, a nice little baseline idea or whatever it is, you know, I've captured it and then uh, I'll, you know, start to either find a different sound for that or if I instantly hear, let's say it's like a really cool arpeggio that I've done. Uh, and if I hear like a rhythm in my head that like a, a beat or something that would sound really cool over it, I'm going to instantly go for that. Don't even mm -hmm. worry about it being a piano sound. Just like I, I need to like first thought best thought the shit out of it <laughs> and just like I like straight, that yeah, yeah just go straight to whatever the because especially if I'm in flow I have to trust mm -hmm. that flow and trust that like when the idea presents itself there's a reason for it and I need to like okay. even if it's getting a rough sketch of it out and that's basically all that first session is is just like going after these different ideas as they pop into my head and, and making this like uh, it's it's usually like a 16 to 32 bar loop that I'm able to like mute and unmute parts and kind of hear how different things work together and mm -hmm. and then as I approach like you know a few hours into it I, I like to kind of step away from all of it almost if like it was a dream in a way and uh then come back to it at another point. And, uh, you know, I have a lot of sessions like that where, so maybe this, this is kind of what my older process was like. And I've gotten to a new place where I want to export 
the track, what the demo, no matter how rough it is, like in that first session, I, I feel like doing that actually makes me finish the songs a lot quicker and makes me, uh, it makes me more focused on, on act, like the chances of that song turning into something are way mm -hmm. higher if I export it in that first session. That's amazing. I, so there is I a love little that bit, piece of advice. Yeah. yeah. That's great. So there, so there is a rough arrangement that happens in that first session a lot these days. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's all about getting out the, um, like whatever the initial sort of like inspiration that's hit me and, and like turning that into like a solid loop. And then at a certain point, I'm like, okay, I, I got to start arranging this. Uh, Cause I, um, you know, maybe I'm, a lot of times it's it, that arrangement will happen at the very last stage before I'm like ready to call it quits for the day. And that could last anywhere from, you know, an hour to sometimes even 15 minutes. Like I, I try to just oh, wow. crush that phase as fast as I, I can. And, um, and, and then, you know, at least I'm able to have an export and I can listen back mm -hmm. to it and then make decisions on, okay, I want to change the sound. I want to go back in and like, um, make this snare more present. Cause there are, of course, like mix, there's mixing going on in this whole process, of course, but, um, you know, I'm not too focused on the mix at this point. If there's something right. obvious that I need to change, like, Oh, like I can't even hear the clap right here. Like I'm going right. to go and, and turn it up. I'm not going to save that until the mixing phase. Um, like I look at it as like I want like 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 I want to make this song as ready as possible to send to someone else to mix, even though I know I'm gonna mix it. Like I want it to be as ready as possible um, to to send off. Um, so yeah, like you know, I'll, I'll give myself that opportunity to listen to the export in the car, mm -hmm. whether that's like on my drive back home or you know on the headphones on a walk or whatever the case may be, even on laptop speakers, a lot of times are like very revealing of things because uh, you're hearing them in a different context or even on my, I love listening to stuff on my iPhone speakers. Cause like, you know, a, a lot of people consume music that way, sadly, like that, you know, through yeah. TikTok and Instagram and just whatever, even, even just watching mm -hmm. stuff on YouTube or, you know, they're listening to it on these tiny little speakers and, you know, I, I try not to be super conscious of that when I'm uh, writing music, but I do like to, you know, I, I think it's more about like ideas will present themselves when I listen to my music in different contexts and out of outside of the studio. I think that's really important and, and why yeah. bouncing that initial demo as rough as it may be uh, it, after that first session is like so crucial because then it actually like you know gives that song a chance to to be finished uh much more than if it's just sitting in a loop in a session that i have yeah. to like open up one day and be like oh yeah i forgot about this one it's like <laughs> I, I i can't forget about it if it's like already in a playlist on my iphone or whatever um but yeah so yeah. Once I've kind of gone back and forth between this, like making iterations and like figuring out like what thing, you know, the different sounds I'm going to change out, or maybe I'm, you know, doing some arrangement decisions and I've got it to a good place where love the arrangement, love all the scents and sounds and samples and uh, the drums that I've used, the programming, the, uh, you know, uh, like all, all of that that stuff, uh, I, I commit to it and I start printing the stems. And I think I'm, there's there's almost like this relief that I feel when I do that as well, because it feels more mm -hmm. final. Because yeah, if I were to be like, okay, now it's time to mix. If I have that session open and I've got all of like my automation and all of like the original plugins and like you were mentioning, like just, they almost become distracting in a way. And I, and I'm too tempted to go back and do like micro adjustments on like oh, yeah. the, the timbre of a synth or, you know, 
be a little too picky on like what like the snare sample I used was or whatever it is. And uh, like one kind of thing that I remind myself is that like once I move into mixing phase and I've got all these all, all this audio in a fresh session with no plugins yet. Um, if there is anything I really want to change, I can always go back in that session. I can always rebounce that stem and change the sound. Or even like the beauty of Ableton is uh, if I've got a mix session open and there's like a certain thing that I want to adjust, or maybe like there's a whole other, like let's say the synth sound that I have going uh, is a little too flat sounding and, and, and maybe like I want to add some like layers to it. You can just literally go in the browser, find that session, drop down the menu to where that track is, mm -hmm. drag it over into your mix session and you've got the MIDI and I can just, you know, do some production tweaks there in the mix session. I try to keep that minimal, great. Uh, but it, I have the option. So, you know, mm -hmm. that's also a, a part of that uh, freeing feeling. Like when I start bouncing the mix stems, uh, I, I'm like, you know what, it's, it's fine. I'm, I'm committing as much as I can right now, but if I need to, I have, have a backup. But yeah, there's just something beautiful about opening up just audio in a, in a fresh session and especially if you've had some time between like making the track and and mixing it it's like you're almost mm -hmm. appreciating it in a new way it's like especially if you've done a lot of midi programming like when you're looking at midi and, and as opposed to like looking at audio it's 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 almost like you hear it differently you see the transients you can see like you know, like parts that get really loud and parts that are, uh, you know, like super quiet or parts that, you know, I don't know. It's just like having that visual component of like just a fresh session with just audio. Mm -hmm. And also it's almost like, it feels like you're remixing in a way. It feels like you're, uh, it's like you're taking a song and, and, you know, I'll, I'll go in and I'll like reverse a part of the audio or I'll like right. stutter a part of the audio, you know, because a, a lot of what I did very early on was my process was more like, like when I was using Impulse Tracker, mm -hmm. I would bounce the track out of Impulse Tracker and I would open it up in uh, SoundForge, uh, which was like this old school um, audio editing software. <laughs> I was like P uh, P PC based. Yeah, it was like, I don't think they ever made it available on, on Mac, but uh, it was my go-to for like the finalization process. And what I would do is I would just, I would mangle that bounce. I would like go through <laughs> and, cause the cool thing about, um, I think Pro Tools kind of does this too, bit of a longer way of doing this, more convoluted way of doing this in Ableton. But basically you could select like any little, little part of the audio and apply like a specific effect only to that part of the audio mm -hmm. and then you know it's destructive editing so it's like you put that in there you better hope that you want that in there because you can't I mean if if I can't yeah, undo it if I get a hundred steps down the line and I don't like that sound undo 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 I have to undo like literally <laughs> hundreds of steps uh which is you know not optimal it's a little, <laughs> or you know a little tedious <laughs> yeah but there was some I think that definitely added to my sound back in the day and you know when I started when I made the switch to just working in Ableton I I started to notice a lot of that approach was missing and you know like I was still applying effects and you know doing doing fun little sound design tricks but a lot of times it was you know like the whole process of doing it through automation and then like bouncing the audio and stuff like that is while it does give you more freedom in the sense that you can go back and change things without having to undo hundreds of levels of edits there's still like you know the 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 process is completely different and i find that like i'm a little bit more hesitant about uh 
because of all all that's required for you to like apply those like little affecting uh, sound design moments yeah it, like just in the uh, like in, in the session, like before you've gone into mix mode, before I've gone into mix mode. So when I'm in, in the mix session, I've just got audio. I actually start thinking about it a little bit differently and, and start treating the different stems and different sounds almost as samples, as opposed mm -hmm. to like, oh, this is, this is just part of the song. Like my mind's not thinking like, what can I do to like mangle this little part of the audio whenever I've got like, you know, the regular production session open. But when I have the mix session, I just start like thinking about the audio differently. And, you know, so I'm still making production choices in that mix session. And I think there's, you know, there's a lot of lines as I've started getting more and more into uh, mixing. I've, I've started noticing there's a lot of lines that are blurred between production and mixing especially as i'm starting yeah. to like watch a lot of these tutorials with these like mixing geniuses like jason joshua and dave pensato they're a lot of stuff that they're doing is production you know they're they're taking like little aspects of this uh like a vocal snippet and then they'll go through and like make its own kind of like moment or whatever where they apply a bunch of effects just to that one sound and and it becomes like it, it sounds like a production choice you know and and mm -hmm. so I uh so again like when I'm in the the mixing phase there's still going to be like some production kind of choices that that go down right. but um yeah I, I think yeah just the, the most important aspect of having that fresh session with audio only it just like there's something that happens in my brain that like makes me think about it differently it, it's it, it, there's that that detachment again i'm right. detached from my original creation and almost i'm less precious about it if it's like I've, I've already committed to the production the the main bread and butter production choices that i've made in the past and now i can kind of approach it and like do whatever i want with it if that means like you know what i don't even like this synth part playing here i'm gonna take it out like and or has been if i had the plug in open with all the automation and and all the like you know, hour I spent on building that synth sound for that one part, I'm going to be a little more hesitant about muting right. that in that section. But if it's just an audio stem and and uh, lo looking at me, like I'll be like, all right, you're out of here. That's that's an easier decision for me to easier. make. Easier, yeah. Yeah. I'm curious how how long cool. on on average, and I know it's a it's always a difficult question, a typical kind of question because it really varies. But on a, an average length of time that it would take to finish a track, what, what is that for you, would you say, from the inception of the idea through to mixed and out the door? I mean, oof. Uh, yeah, it's, it's it, it would be hard to average it because if I truly did average it, it would, you know, that uh, I would say like five years. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> let's uh, pull yeah. the really, really long ones and the super short ones out of yeah. it. And look kind of a normal distribution curve. What kind of thing might be in the middle? <laughs> right. I, uh, and and I, ideally, I would say, uh, I mean, yeah, the songs that like, like newer and like, cause you know, okay. So for example, on A View of You, the reason I say five years is because uh, <laughs> a view a view of you. There's a few songs on there that were like, um, like nearly ten years old, wow. uh, that, uh, nearly ten years old, that I kind of resurrected because uh, you know that time separation between when I originally started the demo and listening to it in the future uh, allowed me to have a new appreciation for it and also have a more reductionist kind of approach to it where i'd be like oh you know what this is the idea right here let's focus on that let's get rid of all this other stuff less precious about it, it there's a reason i never released this song and it's because all this stuff like i was never really happy with but what i was happy with was this so let's focus on this and uh so those songs obviously you know went through so many different versions and iterations and i was never happy with and then finally landed on uh 
a final version. And, and that mixing approach where I bounce stems really came in handy for those old songs, especially uh, just because um, that really helped me like just appreciate them in a, in a whole new way. Uh, but then there were some songs in the album that I had written or in the same time frame that I was like uh, giving new life to these older songs. So those songs, I guess the, would the Relic be one of those? The Relic it was uh, maybe like one, of, I'm trying to think. Oh, actually, I, I would say that the song that took the shortest amount of time on A View of You would have been Cane Train. But it's probably because oh, wow. it's the That's... most, it's probably the most minimal out of all of them. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, there's really just the, the sample and the drums. Mm -hmm. and the vocal it's really like there's not a lot of complication going on in that uh and that's like so that's, the most popular track too right now, i know which is well, crazy there, it just popped out there you go yeah there you go <laughs> it's yeah i mean you know sometimes simple connects more because you mm -hmm. know people don't have to like think about it as much and you know it's, right. it doesn't have to be so academic uh which that you know i definitely veer into that i can't help myself you know i'm fascinated with like prog rock and like math rock and <laughs> different you know um modern classical music and uh you know like S steve reich and and stuff like that that you know involves polyrhythms and different perceived time signatures and like odd odd time signatures and and so i can't help but experiment with stuff like that but yeah. you know like i also just love a good groove and something that's just like hits you in the face and 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 the academia that I apply to those more simple songs come through in the mixing phase I think and come through and just making the shit slap <laughs> you know yeah. just making yeah. it like really cut through and just learning the, it the science <laughs> behind it I mean there's there's yeah. a science to it you know you can't just For like sure. turn every you can't just turn everything up and then like there it is and you're you've got a slapping song there's just like <laughs> there's so much precision to you know like paying attention to transients and like you know how like different frequencies are uh you know affecting each other in the mix down and just all of that it's it's equally an academic process right. as it is like figuring out like how crazy of a time signature and like uh you know that i can throw into this pop song or whatever right yeah well i mean um you mentioned that you you went to full sail university for audio engineering is that correct that's right yeah so i mean that must have been instrumental in really helping you to get your your tracks to to slap which they absolutely do every single one of them um and so i have another question like uh, are you ever unsure about anything you release or do you just release everything? Or, or I mean, like, ha, do you ever have a moment where you were like, oh, I don't really know about this one. Like, <laughs> uh, I don't think, I don't think I've ever released something that I was like unsure of, but I def, mm -hmm. I mean, literally everything I release is unfinished, you know, like uh -huh, nothing yes. is, <laughs> nothing is ever going to be a hundred percent finished. You just have to get it to that. Like, 85 bare minimum to 90 percent right. area where you know the next 10 percent is just going to be like iterating that will never end and then it's like right. yeah that nine getting from 90 to 91 percent can be like hours of time and 91 to 92 can be like hours of time and then it almost like increases right. more and more as you get closer to that 100 100 percent concept because True. even if yeah. you're you'd be kidding yourself to say it was 100 percent finished because you know you know for a fact that like once that song's out there and you've given yourself a year let's say or <laughs> five years like you're gonna listen to that song and hear different things that you wanted to do like yeah it's so, yep. it's so true so, yeah <laughs> yeah so just being comfortable with that almost like gives a freedom to allowing yourself to be like oh, you know what it's as good as it's going to be i'm happy with it right now like it excites cool. me i love putting it on um that's good enough and then um you know letting it go it's like you're 
it's kind of like abandoning a child in a way uh, <laughs> and it, it's kind of it's sad there's like this this sadness but it's almost like you're um not even abandoned it's like it's like they've uh they're they've graduated high school and it's like time for them to like li- right. live on their own and like have their own life experiences yeah absolutely <laughs> do you have you because you mentioned earlier sort of your listening process when you're checking out your peers work and your friends tracks do you bounce your music off of other people before you abandon the child <laughs> <laughs> i used to be i used to be a lot better about that um but i felt <laughs> i think part of what happened was i like so I I used to have this habit of like when I would get together with friends I'd be like just so excited to play them what I was working on and and almost to the point where I felt like I was just doing it too much where it was like more about that that's what our hanging out experience was was just like me coming over playing my new music that I'm working on talking about it uh, or you know getting high while listening to it with them or whatever it is and, and like and what like I don't know now I'm a bit more hesitant um, about sending out music uh, I'm trying to get over that I definitely have like a select few friends that I, I bounce stuff off of but I you know when it comes to like uh, like any sort of critical feedback yeah I, I don't I don't really have a good system in place for that. And maybe it's something I, I definitely need to, uh, to work on for sure. I tend to trust my own tastes and trust my own uh, vision and, mm-hmm. and you know, instincts when it comes to you know, like finishing a song and whether I think it's complete or if there needs to be any changes. Because it you know, could also be a slippery slope of like, you know, getting other people's opinions uh about what you what they think you should change you know i think uh there's obviously there could be value in that but i think you know this applies to life in general you know i think when you're actively seeking advice that's when you allow people to you know give it to you and then you have to take it with a grain of salt you have to yeah like you know there there's this uh there's a saying that you know everything is and isn't at the same time so and what that means is like everybody especially you know you can look to the masters and look to like experts in their field and they're going to have one way of viewing the world and viewing how to do things and like they've got like their system in place and it's like there's so much of that available now, especially like with the information age that we live in and, and access to like gaining knowledge on how other people, you know, even people listening to me talk today on this podcast, like I think it's more important to be aware of things that are said that resonate with you. And when those things resonate, then you can kind of take that into like your arsenal of beliefs and, and your, your systems that you've created for yourself and your, and, but if you just like latch on to like what other people are saying or their opinions and just take everything to, to heart, then that's going to lead you down so many paths and just like confuse you. And, you know, so I think it's more about like, if you do have that circle of friends or whatever that you trust and they give you criticism it's like listen to it and if there's something that they say that sparks an idea or spark that resonates with you then pay attention to that and be aware of that and be like you know what maybe they're right on this but if they like are saying something and in your heart you're like i don't know i don't i don't know if that you know like i respect what they're saying but i don't necessarily believe what they're saying and uh yeah, again, that can apply to making your music better or just like becoming a better person in general. That's really yeah. sound That's advice, awesome. this idea of listening to your intuition and it, it vibes mm-hmm. nicely. There's a, a saying that I always love, which is don't be a follower, be a student. 
which is exactly mm. exactly what you're saying. It's take it in and what resonates with you, what connects with the things you've learned and your experiences and your goals and where you want to go, as opposed to just blindly taking everything that you're told and allowing that to, yeah. to kind of steer you through life. So I have a, a couple of uh, questions before we wrap things up, which is just around the, the releasing side of things, because getting your music out into the world is for people when they're first going to do it and a lot of people listening to this can be quite a scary thing and I know it's I'm asking you to jump back in time quite a chunk here back to I think sort of 2000 kind of time um what was it like getting your first music out sending it out to to a label how was it discovered what was that experience like for you and do you have any advice for anyone who's kind of sitting on some music and they're just not quite pulling the trigger on the, on sending it out yeah um, for example (laughs) (laughs) i mean i i feel like my experience is very you know very unique in that you know the i'm watching a squirrel walk by with a pomegranate in his mouth right now that's very cute (laughs) we have a pomegranate tree in our backyard that's just really crazy this it's huge and just like this little squirrel carrying it uh (laughs) anyway uh my yeah my experience with um releasing like my first music my my first albums uh it's very unique to my situation because you know it it goes back to you know that discovery phase and being on irc and meeting friends through the internet because that's essentially how I released my first record you know I met uh Gabe who ran Merck Records uh on IRC and this is before he even had the record label you know he used the name Merck uh, it was like his graffiti name like his tagging name Mm -hmm. and uh so there was also his screen name and you know we became good friends and you know sharing music with him all the time and then at a certain point he's like hey I'm thinking about starting a label and I really want your music to be the first release that we put out on, on it. And I'm like, that's amazing. And I was in high school at the time and it was just so crazy to like, be able to, you know, show my friends, like I have a CD, like, this is crazy. (laughs) Like, um, and I I don't even think we did vinyl at first. Um, yeah, I think we were only doing CDs, but yeah, you know, it was, it was a really unique experience for me. But I think one way that you could kind of apply that to now is just get, you know, connecting with communities, connecting Mm -hmm. with other artists, even other people that aren't necessarily artists, but just other, you know, people that are active in those same communities Mm -hmm. that are in love with music and appreciate the music that you're making. And you never know, like one of those friends that you meet in that community might start a label one day or or maybe they right. have a label already and you know it's i think you know that's a really important way of of starting off is you know like i i don't have that experience of sending demos to labels you know just like my first ever like i don't have anything released nothing to give me any sort of uh like clout or credibility other than the demo that's sitting in their pile of other demos. Like I've right. never done, I've never done, I, I did do that a couple of times, but you know, mm-hmm. never got a response. Um, but yeah, so having, you know, a friend who believed in me release my music was, you know, huge. It was just, that it was just huge. really huge. And so, yeah. so many opportunities came, uh, arose from that situation. Obviously it was the, the conception of machine drum and the, the beginning of, of everything. And so I guess, yeah, it's just like, make sure that you're communicating with other music lovers and, and fostering a community and taking an active role in your community and getting to know other artists that are maybe at your level or a little bit above your level and like learning from them and, you know, just, just making sure you're sharing as much as possible and, like I said, nowadays, I'm, I'm a bit more, um, I, I keep my music a little bit closer to me into like a smaller mm-hmm. circle of friends. But I think a really big part of why, you know, I had that initial success was because I was just 
sharing so much. I was just so excited for everyone to hear what I was working on and just wanted to get it in front of as many people as possible. And, you know, and I, I think that that could still work today, you know, just finding Absolutely. out ways to, and, and, you know, people have a special opportunity now to create their own hype in a way where you, I didn't have that in the past. In the past, it was like you were, you were really reliant on a label to release your music. That was kind of the only the the way you could make it. You know, there weren't mm-hmm. there wasn't SoundCloud, there wasn't social media. You didn't have like these ways to create your own brand and your own kind of image and uh, cult status without like a label present. Um, And people have that now, which, you know, it's a double-edged sword, of course, you know, you can Mm -hmm. very easily get lost in the amount of content that's out there. And, uh, but you can't be focused on that. If, If you're focused on like, oh, there's just so much out there. Like, why, why would anybody pay attention to me? Those kind of thoughts and those kind of affirmations are just going to make your subconscious express more of that because it's you start paying attention to the confirmation bias that like oh no one's going to pay attention to me and it's like yeah well so you'll see that like no one liked the post so you're like yeah so see like no one's paying attention to me and you've noticed that like oh like i no this person didn't respond to my email about my demo see like that confirms like I'm never going to make it. And if you keep thinking that, then you're never going to make it. But if you just believe in your music and believe that you're making music that you love and that if you love it, someone else has got to love it. Like you're not, (laughs) your, your tastes aren't so unique that literally no one else (laughs) has even like a fraction of them. And just believe that those people are out there, your people are out there and they're waiting to hear it. And you just have to keep sharing and keep making. And because like, even in the creation process and and just making new music, you're getting better at it. You're learning more. And it's just like, make you think things just get better and better from that point. And you just have to have to believe that there's, there's going to be a point where things connect and, and then they just kind of explode from there. Wow. What an amazing piece Floor of clap. advice. To, yeah. Clap. <laughs> That's it. That. There's a double underline under the podcast for you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for coming. That was super. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and so, so we're dying to know what can we expect next from you? So obviously yeah. uh, Elysium, we've talked about that fantastic album under your T Stuart Monica. Will there be more? coming out in that vein we going back to machine drum where are we going is it a surprise not going to tell you what, what's, <laughs> what, what can we expect <laughs> a little bit of everything of course uh, a little bit of t stewart some machine drum stuff going on um going into the studio with uh, jimmy edgar in september to start on the Yay. next jets album nice. uh me and uh praveen, me and praveen sharma have had an ep in the works for a few years now and we've just been like pecking away at it when we can we we really like working nice. on the songs together in person and you know now that we live on two different coasts that opportunity those opportunities are few and far between but mm-hmm. um we are getting closer with that one as well um been working with a lot of artists uh with Tenariel on her new album uh been working with uh Tinashe uh, on a bunch of songs, uh, which has been so much fun. Um, and yeah, like, you know, I signed with Warp Publishing a couple of years ago and their, mm-hmm. uh, their head A&R uh, here in LA is like amazing. Uh, Rico, he uh, is like, he, he's just really got his finger on the pulse. Like he knows like what new artists are kind of like uh, up and coming and he, and um and so he puts me in the studio with a lot of these artists, which, you know, is such a great opportunity for me to learn and grow through these, you know, younger, fresher minds that are bringing new ideas to the table and getting me outside of my comfort zone, um, which is, you so, know, really important to growth. And the live performances, any on the way? 
Uh, just a few. I'm doing an after party for uh, Sound Tribe Sector 9 in a couple of weeks in Santa Cruz. And then I've got um, Illfest in Austin, actually. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'll be coming to Austin. Uh, and I believe that is that in, is that in September, or October, or the other. Uh, then working on working on some other events uh that aren't confirmed just yet but um mostly just doing a lot of studio work right now which is you know i do love a good live show a good dj set um but i really feel like the, the most excitement for me is is in the create creative process and being in, in the studio very cool amazing wow what an interview that was fantastic <laughs> happy to uh, thank you guys I'm so happy. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much. This was fabulous. And I, of course. I, uh, I, I wasn't even sure if, uh, if we were going to get you on here and I, I couldn't believe it. It's like a dream come true. So very, very happy to have you and thank you for taking your time. Uh, taking of course. Time I really appreciate yeah. you guys having me. One quick question is, is this a, a video podcast or is it going to be audio only? Uh, both. Both. Okay. <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm glad you're telling me that now because I think uh would have affected the way I talked a little bit <laughs> I, I just got I just got back from my hike before the uh the 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 podcast uh interview came up and uh, so I haven't even had a chance to shower or change clothes so it's kind of kind of funny <laughs> like I'm learning that now but uh all good people can kind of see me uh when i'm in in the rough rough in your uh, element <laughs> yeah, yeah well, I mean, it. it's been a, been absolutely amazing as well and you know just to round out the the episode with a, a kind of a quick um i guess summary from myself of the things that really resonated with me is the way that you talk i guess maybe spiritual is is the word that i'm picking up on but you've got this spiritual connection to your music to the way that you live your life to the way that you experience maybe is even a, even a more strong word particularly you talked about the um the power of now which is uh, obviously a, a book that you've read and the the way that you're experiencing the world and serendipity and how things are unfolding into your music and it was just this really nice thread and even the way you listen to people's music and your advice about community and collaboration um it really wrapped it up really nicely that that whole entire journey that you know people don't necessarily get that window into people's approach to their music and how they view their lives so just a huge thank you for sharing that and i thought you articulated it really really well and i was absolutely kind of glued to everything you were saying from start to finish so like, a huge thank you for being on the show you're awesome Ah, oh, thank you. Thank you guys so much. You know, I, I really uh, appreciate people that appreciate this kind of conversation, appreciate, you know, flow based. Yeah, just topics. And yeah, it just, I think, you know, have, I, I did sort of have an understanding of like what your show is about before I came in. So it definitely kind of opened my mind up to like, just like flowing and, and talking about things that I'm excited about. So uh, yeah, it was uh, much appreciated. Awesome. Well, let's sign off for this episode oh, awesome. then. Tara, Travis, awesome. And we we'll definitely, if we can, get you back on again, Travis, because we've got a load more we'd like to ask as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Of course. Cool. Thank when the you time so comes. much. Brilliant. Absolutely. Thank you guys.